that reality is mysterious in a way that the mind does not and will probably never be able to comprehend. And most important for our ex exercise together today is the idea that we have to look at contemplative inquiry even to get a workable organization of thinking to operate effectively in our lives and are already doing so, even though we may not have noticed it and may have been hoping up to now that science could give us a whole answer. We're going to focus today on, on the contemplative inquiry approach, but just to have the in mind that that's only one of four very important approaches to truth is, is, is helpful. And it's one reality we have on our hands here, there are several approaches. This is kind of discouraging to some people because there are people in the world who think that the scientific approach to truth should give us everything. And it can't give us everything. Because the I is not even considered in this approach to truth. Furthermore, what we've learned in the scientific approach to truth is that it's approximate. Of course, our evolution created a mind that does a lot of good in approximating, enough to get us by, uh, but to ever assume that what you possess as a cosmology or as a worldview or as a philosophy of life is the absolute picture of what reality is, is a delusion. The Newtonian how would we say it? Cosmology. Newtonian cosmology has been superseded by New Einsteinian cosmology and, and beyond that, right? So we're always talking about in our cosmology or our scientific overviews, uh, something approximate. Our cosmology is not reality, but reality is more mysterious than our cosmology. And this we have learned in contemporary physics. I mean, the Einsteinian universe just opened up new mystery, but then quantum mechanics uh, simply blew the minds out of physicists themselves. Uh, so that physicists have come to say things like this, the more you know about nature, the more you know you don't know. Instead of progressing in science to where we had better knowledge, when you look back, you see all kinds of things we've learned through scientific research, but it didn't make the mystery any less. In fact, it made our experience of the mystery greater, which means probably, very likely, uh, absolutely certainly, for I'm concerned, that the human mind is incapable of possessing absolute knowledge of nature. Let's take an example of the little photon, which is the the smallest element of light, uh, as well as other things like electrons and protons and atoms. All of these things, these minute things that now define the fundamental particles or pieces or entities of the universe, have found to be in our scientific research manifesting themselves both as waves and particles. So they have two whole systems of mathematics one for waves and one's for particles that are examining the same little old photon. And y you know in your mind that a wave is something that goes out through a medium forever, and a particle is something that's happening to something in one little particular space-time moment. How can the same thing be a particle and a wave? Well, it can't be. A photon is not a wave, and a photon is not a particle. It just acts kind of like a particle part of the time. And it acts like a wave part of the time. And so what you really have out here in reality is a wavicle, <laughs> or something you don't even have a name for. Now this is the state of physics, and it brings physicists to their attention uh, that not only is physics approximate <laughs> and, and, and improvable, but it doesn't even give us a consistent picture of what we're looking at here. And these are the foundational parts of reality upon which all reality is constructed, and we don't even have a picture of it. We may not even be able to picture it. 
I don't know if that does anything to your mind, but it sort of blows mine. We have introduced ourselves to it, a, an approach to truth, which I call contemplative inquiry, where your consciousness, your I, is using a method here. It's a rational method, but it's a method of exploring the I itself, the, the conscience itself, which is a, an approach to reality. A very important approach to reality. All the art creations are using this, consciously or unconsciously. When you write a piece of music, you're putting into expression something about being a being uh, who musics, who rhythms, who vibrates, uh, who has melody, uh, or whatever you might want to say about that. Now, there's another approach to truth equally important, and in fact, we have made more important, which we might call scientific research. And this is consciousness using the method of scientific research to look at not I, not consciousness, but it, some kind of it, which is an approach to reality. Now by it, I mean uh, tables and water bottles and other beings. Uh, it might be looking at the brain of some human being with the instruments that can measure what's going on in your brain. But science doesn't look at consciousness. It only looks at manifestations of consciousness like brain vibrations or behaviors of conscious beings, animals and humans. But the process of the approach to truth called scientific research is to look at the its. So if you're a brain researcher, uh, you're, you're, you're interested in what consciousness is going on in the person whose brain you're looking at. But if you want to know, you have to what? Ask that person who's the brain owner what they're feeling. And then you can see if that particular feeling or state of consciousness corresponds to the electrical instruments that you're using to observe brain waves and so forth. This contemplative inquiry is an approach to truth about reality. And this scientific research is an approach to truth about reality. And it's the same reality that's being approached. But contemplative inquiry can't see scientific research approach. And the scientific research can't see the contemplative inquiry approach because it's only dealing with its. It's not looking at consciousness. It is part of the motif of science to not be subjective, but to be objective. And consciousness is not an object. Consciousness is only experienced directly by your conscious being looking at your consciousness. So the scientist is not studying consciousness ever. Only reports of consciousness, behaviors of conscious beings, but conscious itself, in order to even understand what you mean by the word, has to use this other approach to truth. A psychologist has to sort of straddle these two approaches to truth because you don't know anything about your psyche without looking inside to see a psyche. Uh, and so there are behavioral psychologists who emphasize behaviors and reports uh, as a clue to understanding everything about uh, your psyche, which is, of course, not possible, actually, because they have to correspond to what they can experience inwardly. And then there are depth psychologists who emphasize the contemplative inquiry pole for understanding the psyche, even though they would also have the scientific look at your brain and your behavior as part of their reference in elaborating their psychology. Now this approach to truth idea as I learned from Ken Wilbur, and he has 
two other approaches to truth, both of which he calls the, the we approach. And the we approach has two subcategories. Approach to intimacy and the approach to commonality. These are my words, not his, but I think that's what he means. By intimacy, I mean the kind of thing that goes on when one eye confronts another eye. Uh, you're, you're doing a experience of reality that's very different from simply looking inside your own consciousness. You're sharing consciousness. Uh, there's connection on an intellectual level, but there's also connection on an emotional level, on a sensory level, uh, maybe on a sexual level. Intimacy is a dynamic of reality discovery uh, that is bringing some of the it and some of the I together into an experience of one-to-one. -one. Of course, it may happen in a group larger than one, but intimacy is a, a we approach to truth. We are a we being. Uh, we have our being in relations to other people. Commonality is a little different than intimacy. Commonality are the social patterns and structures and processes that you use to have society as a human family. So the English language, for example, is one of our commonalities. Uh, having the English language together allows us to elaborate our intimacy and our thinking and so forth together as a group. There are other commonalities, such as educational structures and, and uh, political structures and economic structures. All these commonalities are pulled together by humanity to be an, an approach to truth. If you want to talk about justice or social revolution or repair of society, uh, you have pull together things you've learned from the scientific approach to truth and things you've learned from the I approach to truth into proposals of workability for society. And this fact of workability, that this works, that this enables, that this has usefulness, is the test of truth.